we have Stacey McManus, who uh, you've already heard from, um, nicknamed Mac or Macca. That's original, Stacey. <laughs> um, she's, uh, as you heard, with the ACP, Bachelor of Sports Business and Leadership, which she commenced in 2019. Um, she's won 262 caps, 262 caps for the Australian softball team. That's extraordinary. Um, represented Australia at four world championships, uh, 2012 Yukon in Canada, bronze medalist, 2014 Harlem in the Netherlands, bronze medalist, uh, 2016 Surrey in Canada, 2018 Chiba in Japan, and 2020 at uh, the Tokyo uh, Olympics. She began playing softball at the age of four uh, and has also uh, gone pro in 2017. Uh, playing in the National Pro Fast Pitch League for the Chicago Bandits. Uh, and her sister, Brooke, is uh, a member of the New Zealand national softball team. I don't know how that works. <laughs> anyway, welcome, Stacey. Good to have you with Thank us. You. Uh, also with us is uh, Julie Charlton, uh, who is uh, a para-athlete, wheelchair. Um, she's from Dural in uh, Australia, of course. Of course it's Australia. Why wouldn't it be? Um, she's also with the ACPE, doing a Bachelor of Sports Coaching in Management. Uh, she represented Australia at the 2019 Oceania Championships, where she won a gold medal. Uh, she's been a Junior World Champion, International Wheelchair and Amputee Sports Federation uh, 2016. Australian National uh, Champion, the F57 Class Seated Discus in 2021. And uh, also Australian National Record Holder in the F57 seated shot put and the F57 uh, seated discus as well. Her local club is the Cherrybrook Athletics Club and she's also currently a council member of the Children and Young People with Disability Australia and she's a level two athletics coach. Wow, that's a bit of a mouthful, but you are welcome uh, as well, Julie. Great to have uh, the two of you along with Matt, who's uh, still with us. Uh, so we're gonna have a chat uh, essentially uh, about their experiences at the Olympics and the Paralympics. So uh, I want to ask a, a general question of Julie and Stacey first, and feel free to jump in, whoever wants to go uh, first. What was your experience like growing up and being involved in sport? Was it a passion at a very early age, or was it something that somebody introduced you to and you sort of grew to love it? What's your story? Who wants to go I'll, first? Go on, I'll Stacey. go first. <laughs> Well, for me, um, yeah, it's definitely been a passion of mine since I was a very young age. Um, my mum and dad both played softball uh, back in their childhoods, and my mum's American and my dad's from New Zealand, so that's how my sister was able to play for New Zealand. <laughs> um, <Gotcha. laughs> so, yeah, I was down the ballpark every Saturday and Sunday as a young kid growing up, and, um, yeah, just become so passionate about the sport. I've just enjoyed it ever since. Was that, was that an option for you then, playing for New Zealand too? I believe so. Um, but yeah, I've decided to stick with Australia because we're better. <laughs> <laughs> Have you played against your sister? Yes. We played a world that? championships together. Um, it was definitely an experience. Um, I mean, because she plays for New South Wales here in Australia, um, but then wasn't um, selected in the Australian squads, which then she went to New Zealand and was able to play for them. So yeah, it was quite, it was quite an experience and um, a big family affair, I suppose. We had the T-shirts split down the middle of our supporters with one Australian, uh, one half of um, New Zealand. So, yeah, it was awesome. And, and was there a bit of banter on the, on the pitch? Uh, yeah, a little bit. She plays second base like I do, so we're a bit competitive in our positions. And um, when either of us got on base, there was a few cheek. I mean, she knows the whole Australian team. She's grown up with us all, so, yeah. Good stuff. Uh, let's move on to Julie. Uh, same question, Julie. What, what was your experience like uh, growing up and being involved in sport? So I was very lucky to fall into sport because I actually grew up hating it. I, in school, was never uh, involved in sport because the school system didn't know how to include me. So I'm an expert at catch if anyone wants to play when we're back on campus because all I was allowed to do was go with my aid and play catch in the corner while everyone learned how to play AFL or soccer and so on and so forth. Um, and I moved from that school and I finally went to my 
the second school I ever went to and my PE teacher at the time had done his teaching degree in England where they do a very good extensive course of inclusive education and he said you've never done sport let's actually get you into sport and I'm like cool how do I do it and he entered me in an athletics competition and he said, you're going to be throwing some shot put. And I'm like, what's a shot put? Little eight-year-old me at the time had no idea what to do, but off I went and I got my very first first place ribbon and the support that I had received from the officials and my PE teacher and just the athletics community at the time really pushed me to continue to do it. And from that point forward, I never looked back. And, you know, from the age of eight, now I'm 22. I have done so many athletics things in my life and I'm very lucky to have had that opportunity to do so where someone actually believed in my potential and really thought, yes, let's actually get you involved and look at ways that we can evolve a sport that is stereotypically able-bodied and shape it to fit you which was amazing and I can never thank Mr Butcher enough. Uh, it fascinated that you said oh I hated sport when I was a kid it, I, I presume because you felt so excluded by it it's not that you necessarily didn't like sport but it, it was you 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 can't be a part of this. Yeah exactly so the whole trope of being interested in something is believing that you could also possibly do it. I never had that belief in myself because I was never taught how to be included into it. And so when I had the opportunity to be included, to shape a sport that I never thought I could be involved in and actually make it work for me was life changing. Um, and I also never knew about wheelchair racing and I, I do that as a cross training for my seated throws. I, my discus was cancelled one day, one day at my national competition in 2012 and I decided I've already paid for this event, let's do 100 metres in my normal wheelchair. Stupid idea but it changed my life forever because at the end of that finish line was Paralympian Rosemary Little where she came, pulled me aside after I finished my race and she said, if you can go that fast in your day chair, let's get you in a track chair and see how um, fast you can go. And so she invited me to her training sessions. And from there, I was able to get my own racing chair through Wheelchair Sports New South Wales and really develop that skill. And I got to meet Louise Savage and Angie Ballard and Madison De Rosario, who are all amazing Paralympians and amazing careers that I could learn off and Louise is now my coaching mentor moving into this coaching degree that I'm doing um, but just the fact that I was able to go from absolutely nothing and not knowing how to be included to being in the best community possible to learn off and to thrive in something that I love so much has been life-changing and amazing. That's exactly the word so we're going to use, life-changing. And before I ask uh, Julie and Stacey about their um, challenges that they've faced over the last 18 months, just want to bring Matt Carroll back in. Uh, Matt, Julie's experience there is, is fascinating and obviously disturbing in, in its initial uh, conversation. I, I presume we've, we've long moved past that sort of mentality where um, less able people are just thrown into a corner and told to play catch with a friend or, or a coach. Um, we're, we're in a different space now, aren't we? I hope we are. Yeah, no, we, we, we are. And uh, I can't, I'm trying to think, I can't think of one sport that doesn't have, I may be wrong and Julie might be able to correct me on it, but I can't think uh, of this one sport which doesn't have, um, uh, you know, a Paralympic, well, para, para-athlete um, program, um, you know, from even from when I was in sailing, um, uh, you know, the sailing, uh, you know, full quadriplegic uh, uh, was able to sail because of technology and, and but also, and, and exactly what, what Julie's talking about, people who were interested um, and uh, the, the programs they ran in each of the sailing clubs. So it wasn't just about going to the Paralympics, um, it was also just participating in the sport of sailing. Um, and they, 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 they actually got it, got it going with it at the community and the club level. So it has infiltrated through. And I, and I think there's a, you know, 
I think you saw it even the, you can tell by the ratings of the TV of the Paralympic Games. I mean, it was it was well followed, well supported. Uh, I mean, Australia is on, honestly one of the best best countries um, going uh, for for the, for the sports uh, in in that space. So there's also the um, and our athletes too, but the Special Olympics too, um, which is which is you know another I suppose form of disability for one of the word, but you know, I don't look at it as disability. And it's people another another challenge, and uh, they they were held. They were postponed, unfortunately, again. Um, but uh, I know our athletes uh, support that space as well. In terms of the Olympians, go along and, and give, them, give them a hand. Uh, Julia, I just want to ask you about uh, the, you know, the chairs that you use. I imagine this is quite a costly business. The, those track chairs, I would imagine, don't come cheap. They have to be modified. They have to be maintained. And, and I guess there's other equipment that uh, uh, able-bodied athletes don't have to be concerned about. So that it all um, adds up, I guess, in terms of the money that uh, has to be invested for, for para-athletes. Oh, 100%. So to put into perspective, my throwing chair is, well, my athlete, Linda, she got one for $3,000 because it has to be the lightest uh, material possible. Um, my track chair, the very base model was five grand for the actual frame itself. And then the, depending on the wheels that you choose, cause you can either get uh, what we call spoke wheels, um, which are just regular type uh, metal wheels. They are around 800 to a thousand for a pair. And then you can get carbon fiber wheels, which are 1200 and above, and then discs are 2000. So it's an extremely costly just for equipment sport to be in um but again uh organizations like wheelchair sports new south wales um act ha really help the para athletics community to be able to fundraise to get those chairs and they also lobby uh sporting other sporting organizations and the government to receive sport funding so that they can supply chairs to developing athletes who are going to grow and may not want to buy their own chair while they're still developing because then they'll just grow out of it and then they have to spend another ten thousand dollars on another chair which is ridiculous um and not sustainable for a sport so it's amazing that we've got organizations that can help with that but my chair was completely fundraised um, myself with my family and my friends um, and then my second chair was sponsor bought through Wheelchair Sports New South Wales. They found me an organization called BRI Ferrier who helped get my second chair that helped me actually compete at the World Junior Championships in 2016. So that was amazing, but it's extremely expensive, yes. <laughs> These are all things you tend not to think about when you watch the, the Paralympics on TV, I guess, but uh, it's all part of the story. Um, Stacey, let's uh, re return back to you and uh, ask you about your experiences uh, leading up to qualifying for the Tokyo Olympics. Just uh, take us through a little bit of the story and, and was the Olympic experience what you were expecting? Yeah, so to qualify, uh, we had to travel over to China in 2019 um, to play uh, in our region, so the Oce um, Asia Oceana region, uh, which consisted of, I believe, 10, 10 or so countries. Um, and we had to finish first there um, to actually qualify for the Olympics. And I don't believe we've ever had such, uh, like, as Matt said earlier, because of the team sport, they had to reduce the number of teams that competed at the Tokyo Games. So um, previously in other Olympics that softball has been in, there's been a few more countries. So this was quite a hard um, qualifiers to actually um, win to go to the Olympics. So uh, we ended up finishing um, undefeated and probably the most successful our team has ever been in the past um, or since the Beijing Games, which is when we were last in it. Um, so yeah, the, the, the experience to qualify was quite amazing because um, for me, it, the Tokyo Games is, pro is probably going to be my one and only chance to, to go. So it was all leading up to that. Um, so it was just great to yeah, qualify and actually get to the Games. Um, in regard to the Games experience, I mean, you can't really prepare yourself for what it's going to be like. Um, you see 
um, growing up as a kid, I went to the 2000 games where softball uh, was there and just the atmosphere and everything um, that I experienced there at such a young age. And then um, knowing you're going to the games, but under such strict conditions with no fans, no family, um, obviously you want it to be um, with that and have your family and loved ones there supporting you. But I mean, the games experience was once in a lifetime for me and it, it didn't take away the fact that I was now competing for Australia at the Olympics. Um, am, I, am I right in saying you finished fifth Australian team? Yeah, yeah we finished fifth, yeah. Yeah, so you, you got relatively close to a medal, which, which is not everything, but it would have been nice. Um, the other thing is, I, I guess, uh, the nice thing when, you, when you've uh, taken part in the Olympics, you are not a former Olympian. You are just an Olympian for the rest of your life, which is a lovely thing to have. Yeah, definitely. And it goes with what uh, we said, once an Olympian, always an Olympian. Um, and just getting into the village and the way Australia, the team Australia had set up the games and our building in the, um, in the village was just amazing. And it felt so surreal to be there and actually know that, you know, dreams have come true and you get to represent Australia, um, the country you love on the biggest stage. Terrific. Um, Julie, Talk us through your story ahead of Tokyo. Obviously, you were hoping to go to the Paralympics. Not enough qualifying tournaments. Is that correct? Is that what we heard earlier? Yeah, that's right. Uh, because our sport is uh, so expensive, but also very small in terms of its participants, particularly in Australia, um, there are currently only well, I'm the only one of my classification in all of Australia. So classification, if nobody knows, is that little number that was next to my name. I'm an F57. So that just basically means that I have lower body impairment. So including paraplegia, things like that. Um, like I said, I'm the only one in Australia. The qualification criteria usually states that you need at least three of the same classification in an event in order to get a proper qualifier. You obviously cannot do that in Australia. So we try to do as many comps as possible leading up to the games. COVID screwed us over basically. <laughs> we missed out on our nationals because of COVID in 2020. Um, we got state championships and then because of the nature of COVID, it is very dangerous for people with disabilities to put themselves in at risk of you know catching it and I don't think any or well, I know from my own perspective and my own squad's perspective we did not want to risk catching it by going overseas and trying to qualify it in Switzerland or uh what was our other America was our other opportunity but those cases rose and those competitions ultimately got cancelled um, and it all just became very, very, very difficult for all of us. We still pushed forward and as a coach, I really tried to help my athletes get through to be able to at least have a shot at qualifying and we tried to do as many competitions locally and when the borders were just about to close, but almost didn't, we traveled to Queensland and we did some in Victoria, but the lack of training because of lockdown really affected us all. Um, and ultimately it just did not work out. Which is hugely disappointing. Now, in terms of your career, are you gonna push on? You said you're only 22, so you're still quite young. Are you aiming to be in Paris in four years, uh, sorry? It's not four years anymore, is it? It's three. Three. Oh. <laughs> See, the pandemic's even stuffing me around as well. <laughs> no, definitely. Um, my coach, uh, Mitch Kerr, who is also a, a, a student here at ACP, um, we definitely have plans to push forward towards Paris. We've currently got goals to do the Commonwealth Games next year uh, in Birmingham because the shot put for F55 through F57 has been included um, to be combined para and able body competition, which is amazing. 
Um, so that's our next goal. The fo following that would be World Championships, which was actually before the Com Games, but that's a, a dream more than a goal at the moment because we want to focus on Commonwealth Games. Um, and then, yeah, pushing forward towards Paris 100%, see what we can achieve as a team. Well, I hope you get there because obviously you deserve it after missing out on Tokyo. I uh, just want to bring in Matt Carroll again very briefly. Matt, is that an isolated story or are there more athletes who've unfortunately uh, missed out for reasons similar to Julie? Yeah, well, look, I, and I guess, and, and uh, Julie's right, the, for the Paralymp Paralympians, it was a, 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 for all the challenges that, that she mentioned, the health and, and looking looking after themselves is obviously critical. Um, yeah, in the Oceana, uh, we, we were helping, we ran a project with the um, Department of uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, managed it for them to help the Oceana um, Olympians and Paralympians get to the, well, sorry, qualify and prepare for the Games and get to the Games. Uh, their border closures were, were, in some cases, more difficult to navigate than uh, than Australia's border, border closures. So um, some of the Paralympians as well, even though they had qualified for the Games, it's very sad, they qualified for the Games, they couldn't get there. Um, this couldn't we couldn't get them out on a flight uh, we'll get them from their particular nation to another nation where the flights were going from us so that was very disappointing for them but it's the same and able body was similar I mean I mean Stacy sport the, the baseball team the men's baseball team had to get to um, Mexico I think it was um, but then they sort of had to get to Mexico get back quarantine for 14 days and then get to um, to Tokyo and it didn't work uh, didn't work at all, so it it, it affected uh, both both uh, both games, uh, but certainly more so probably the power the para games for the reasons that the Julie Julie flagged. Uh, thanks, Matt. I, I want to return to to Stacey. Um, Matt told us a little bit earlier that softball won't be a part of Paris, which I guess is uh, a big disappointment for you. You said that that was probably your only chance to go to an Olympic game, so. Over the next few years, with no Olympics to aim for, what's what, what are your goals, both individually and for and for the national team? Because that because that carrot's been taken away for for the next Olympics. Yeah, definitely. I think um, softball Australia is still really unsure at the moment of what even the next twelve months look like. Because um, obviously, with the restrictions here in Australia, we've had to postpone our national event. Um, so that national events is usually in January and it's going to be postponed to April, which means there's going to be a short period of time where the Australian team can actually get together um, before the World Games um, in Alabama next year in July. So at this stage, that's really all we know um, of what's happening. Um, but I'm, I'm sure there'll be World Championships in 2024 now that we're not at the Olympics um, and then again, 2026 and, and hope that LA, you know, bring softball back into the games. And then I'm, I'm assuming we're going to have to do the requalification and all those events too. So, uh, but just for, unfortunately for us and for myself, um, softball's now lost a lot of funding um, because we're not an Olympic sport and we also didn't, um, and didn't medal at the recent games. So, it's going to be tough. And for me personally, I think I'm just going to take it one year at a time. Um, I think the LA will be 39, which wouldn't make me the oldest softballer to play, but um, <laughs> it's still a while away. And, you know, I've really enjoyed my studies here at ACPE and look forward to doing what, um, you know, maybe working with the AOC on that respect and getting other athletes over there and kind of doing a flip on that and working on the administrat administration side of the Olympics and that. I was going to ask you, Stacey, uh, about that. You talked about the, you know, the World Championships being in Alabama and uh, various other countries where you might go and play. Um, I don't know an awful lot about softball, but I imagine that there's not a huge amount of money swilling around in that sport. You've just sort of alluded to that. So how do you make ends meet? I know you're studying at the ACP as well, but... Um, when those world championships come around in Alabama and you, you're able, able to just take off, I mean, how, how do you how do you put how do you pay your bills and and keep money coming in? Is it is it a struggle? Uh, 
Yeah, so when I first came into the squad um, back in 2011, we didn't have the same funding that um, because we weren't in the London games at that stage. Um, yeah, you had to work work a full-time job. Um, you know, we have to pay thousands of dollars to go for our national tournaments and then a, a, a few more to go overseas. So I guess you really have just got to save what you can and work as hard as you can. Um, and then when we were coming back into the Olympics, uh, we ended up getting athlete support from the AIS. So that obviously helps a lot. And, I, and me personally, I was able to um, quit my full-time job and just pick up a part-time role and, and study at ACPE in the meantime to, to further studies and for what's to come after my career as an athlete. Um, but yeah, like, yeah, next year, I think we'll, it'll be fully self-funded. So a lot of fundraising and all that type of stuff to, you know, sponsor finding, um, yeah, to just get us through and, and buy. It's, it's literally a labour of love for, for yeah. many sports, isn't it? Um, just, I, I'm going to finish off with it with a question uh, for Julie in a moment, but I just want to return briefly to Matt. Just on that topic, Matt, um, how the government decides... Uh, where the funding goes. And this has been a big uh, bone of contention, hasn't it, over the last few years, that it, it's all about the medals. You know, if we've got a chance of a medal, then you get more money. Is, is that the way it should be? Is that changing? Is it going to change over the next few years? What, what's your view on, on how the money's dished out? Yeah, the, AO, the AOC's view that anyone who qualifies, whether it's a team or an athlete, goes to the Games. We take people to the Games. And we also provide uh, funding to the to the to the sports to athletes. We call it it's called medal incentive funding. Um, I mean, it's never going to replace a full time job. I'll assure you of that. But but uh, but, it, but it does assist. And then for the sports that get no money, we we provide some. Um, yeah, look, it's an arm wrestle. It's a long uh, arm wrestle I'm having with the government. Um, basically, sport funding has dropped by sixty million over the last four years. Um, and so the cakes got smaller, and so I, I could sort of understand the AIS, the Sports Commission. You know, as, as the cake got a bit smaller, have the either you, you cut it up into smaller pieces or you cut some sports out. And, but um, so we're lobbying the government, particularly now we've got this ten-year runway. Um, and if a home game is most important that the team, that the home team does well, and we every any sport that's in the games, we have a spot. So um, it will be represented every, in every sport. I, I, I'm not absolutely sure of the rules of the Paralympics, but I'm pretty sure it's the same, the same, the same, the same scenario. So it, it, that, that investment needs to pick up. Now, it's a lot in the scheme of a trillion dollar budget, um, sport funding is, is not a lot. And I call it sport investment because if they invest in the, in the top end of the sport, the performance end we're talking about here with Stacey and Julie, um, and that promotes the participation uh, part of the sport. I call it the virtuous circle. Now, participation, pathways and performance. You get performance to the ones who inspire. Then you get the kids picking up the participation base. You know, I, I know from the hosting of the Rugby World Cup back in 2003, participation rates in rugby went, went up and up and up because people got inspired to take part of the sport. We have an obesity crisis in our country. We're getting fatter and fatter. Uh, both with our kids and ourselves, and, and sport is obviously a very important factor in we're pulling that backwards. So that's why I can call it an investment. And uh, I think that, that sports should be invested in regardless of whether they get a medal or not, because um, you know, the inspiration doesn't, isn't just about medals. We don't put a medal count out uh, for the Olympic Games. We certainly celebrate someone who's a gold, silver, bronze. Of course you do. Um, but we also celebrate those other special moments. And there were plenty during the uh, Tokyo Games, both Olympic and Paralympic, where people didn't win, but they were inspirational moments and, and people, people loved them. Um, I mean, uh, the, the, the two guys in the decathlon, um, they didn't win a medal, but geez, they were pretty inspiring for the rest of us back here. Being from the UK, as you can tell by my accent, um, a few years ago, uh, Great Britain decided that they were going to put money from the National Lottery, which was then new, it's about 20 years old. Uh, a big chunk of that goes towards funding for Olympic athletes. And you've seen the results of that in terms of Great Britain shooting up the medal table. Is that something that we could do here? Uh, look, look, to be fair, the Sports Commission, they looked at that after the uh, Rio Games. Um, the difficulty is, is that um, uh, lotteries in Australia are managed by state governments, not by the national government. 
and uh, most of the states have sold off their lotteries to private enterprise. So it's just not feasible. Um, there are a couple of ways that we're looking at um, that might be able to generate something similar. Uh, but as I said, look, it, you know, if they've ploughed back what they've taken out over the last three or four, four or five years, which is $60 million, that in itself would answer Stacey's question there. Well, then they wouldn't have to cut the cake up um, the, way, the way they are and uh, would be able to assist the athletes and the uh, para-athletes um, at the same time. Okay, we've got about seven minutes left. I want to ask Julie the, uh, the final question and then I'm going to open it up if anybody's uh, got any questions for Stacey, for Julie, or indeed for Matt uh, before we take a break. Um, Julie, you've, of course, not just a, a, a high-class uh, para-athlete, but you're also a coach as well. Um, how did that develop and how did that impact upon your ability to focus on your own training? I'm sure, I thought you'd have, you'd have enough on your plate by focusing <laughs> on your own performance. Well, I was at that wheelchair sports racing uh, training day and one of the mums from one of the kids came up to me and she knew I was throwing and she's like, can you teach my daughter how to throw a shot put? And I'm sure, like, sure, why not? I was 15 at the time and that's when I went and did my level one with Athletics Australia for coaching and it, it really just moved on from there. I started coaching that athlete and we went further and further national championships. Um, we went to the Arafura Games and the popularity of Seat of the Throws started to rise, uh, which was really, really cool because New South Wales hadn't really seen anybody come through in the last maybe I'd say three Paralympic cycles we had some in Sydney but nothing really since um and then I would I did my level two when I was about 17 and when I graduated high school I had no idea what I wanted to do I actually was going to become a drama teacher and I had just gotten into a Bachelor of Media and Communications uh, at a different university. And at one time, three o'clock in the morning, I'm like, I don't want to do media and communications. And so I applied Good choice, to by the way. Good choice <laughs> not to do media and communications. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I applied for ACP at four o'clock in the morning because they were a sponsor of one of the national championships. And so I knew a little bit about them. Um, but I hadn't googled anything I knew I wanted to coach I knew I wanted to be within sport for the rest of my life and I knew I wanted to be able to advocate in any way possible for para sport and so I knew the best way possible would be to become a coach and to get into the management system so that I could be within the internal system of sport and change it from the inside out um, then because of my connections with Louise Savage she introduced me to her wonderful best friend, Linda Holt, who is silver medalist from the Sydney Paralympics in discus. She'll probably kill me if I get this wrong. It's either discus or shot put. <laughs> she did both. Um, and I've been training her ever since, which has been amazing because she taught me so much about her time as a Paralympian and what that was like for her back in 2000. And then she took a 20 year break and then came back in 2020 to a almost new sport because so many things had changed. And then I was able to use my experience as a semi-elite para-athlete to help her get back into the sport. And that has just been the most amazing experience for me, um, just growing both as a para-athlete and as a, a coach. It hasn't affected my training whatsoever because it has actually motivated me to work harder, not only for myself, but for every, every other person. Because if I work hard on myself as an athlete, I know I can work equally as hard for my athletes. Because if I can succeed, they can succeed. And we can all learn off of each, of each other. Um, and so that's kind of the philosophy I take into my coaching and into my athletics for myself.